So today I'm going to talk about receiver functions, um, and this is a, a popular global seismological technique uh, that has many parallels to reflection seismology. Uh, and so this was pioneered by Chuck, Lang Chuck Langston in the 1970s, um, and it exploits the fact that there's this upcoming P wave uh, beneath uh, a seismic station, a receiver, um, and it will generate conversions um, from that P wave um, to an S wave. Uh, and this will primarily, so it occur at any kind of velocity discontinuity, but the larger velocity con discontinuity there is, the easier it is to observe this conversion from the P to the S wave energy. And so the time separation between the phases, between the direct P and the converted phases, there will also be some reflected phases in there as well, that the time separation between these phases can be used to determine the depth of that interface, where the velocity discontinuity is. Um, and it can also tell us about the velocity of the layer above it. So receiver function can be a real valuable technique for figuring out the structure, uh, particularly at crust and lithospheric scales. So I want to describe the, the seismic ray paths for the receiver function. Um, so again, what we need to envision here is, is these P waves are coming from teleseismic distance, so relatively far away, greater than 30 degrees uh, away. And so it, it, because of that distance, it's primarily traveling through the lower mantle uh, for much of its path. And so it's fairly clean sort of signal when it comes up to the station. So what I'm going to show here are some seismic rays that are se seismic energy that's coming up um, through the mantle uh, and then starts to interact um, with the moho, the discontinuity between the crust and the mantle. And there'll be some conversions uh, as well as some reflections at the moho. So I'm going to start with just a simple direct P wave, right? So the energy comes in, it refracts, it changes its angle because the velocity is faster in the mantle than in the crust, right? But that's our typical sort of P wave energy that would be recorded, right? But that energy that comes through um, the mantle as a P wave, it can convert to an S wave at the moho, right? So you can get a, um, a different set of energy that comes off as an S wave. Now, if we return to the P wave uh, that went up to the surface, we, it can also reflect off the surface and then reflect off the moho and come back up to the surface. So this is like a reverberation uh, in the crust. And so you'll see that there are four legs here, the P, 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 right? So this is the first leg, this is the second, the third, and the fourth, right? Uh, the, the lowercase and uppercase just show whether or not it's upgoing or downgoing, right? So the, originally the P way went down, it curled uh, through the mantle and came back up again. And then here's the up part, the down part, and the up part. You'll see this referred to as the PPMP sometimes because it's bouncing off the moho and the N and the N is described that way. All right, but this, this energy that goes off the surface and then off the moho can also, again, convert to an S wave, right? So you'd end up with a PPPS, right? Now you can also have energy that converts to an S wave at the surface, right? And comes down as an S wave. And then from here, it can travel uh, as an S wave. So there's two legs as P here and then two legs as S. But it can also, when it hits here, it can also convert back to a P wave and come up to the surface. Now this path is actually similar to the one that traveled along here, right? That, that this energy is primarily traveling as a P wave, but one leg is as an S. And that S leg can either be here or over here. They, they arrive at the same place. Okay, so I think this is you know, a little complicated, uh, but I think useful to see that there are a couple of different conversions and reflections that travel up to the surface and then we can record. But this is sort of showing them being recorded at multiple different places. And that's not what's happening with the receiver function. The receiver function is all of the energy is recorded at the same receiver. So I'm going to show that now where we have multiple paths coming up through the mantle that all arrive at the same receiver. That, that's truly what is happening when we uh, calculate a receiver function. So here we have our direct P wave energy that comes up to the receiver. We then have a P wave that converts to an S and, and travels up to that receiver, right? So it travels through a different angle because the S wave velocity is different than the P wave velocity. So they have slightly different paths in the mantle, right? Then there's another one that, that um, traveled through the mantle a different path and then reverberates through the crust, right? Bouncing off the surface, the moho, and then to the receiver. Okay, but that last leg there is the same as the direct P. Right, we then have the the wave that travels two legs as a P and then travels two as an S, and so it's similar to the PS converted phase and that last leg. And then we have the, the pair that travel um, one leg as an S wave. So we have one that goes up as a P 
uh, comes down as a P and then goes as an S. We also have one that goes up as a P, travels an S, and then back to a P. So those both uh, arrive at the same time um, because they're, they're traveling as P and S way. All right, so I want to show, so all of those, you know, things that are arriving at the same receiver, then they can all be recorded on the same seismogram. Okay, and so this is showing that we can see these different arrivals, right? The different phases I just talked about are shown here, right? And the, the more it travels as an S wave or the longer it travels in the crust, um, the sort of later it would occur in time, right? The P is the fastest, it's the most direct, travels the fastest by, so it comes in first, right? But I wanted to accentuate here that the P arrivals, the, the last leg as a P, right? Versus the last leg as an S, they are better recorded on different components. The vertical component, right? The, the, the seismometer that's designed to record the vertical energy, that tends to record the, the things that arrive as P waves better. And then the radial component, the sort of horizontal sort of component, that tends to record the stuff that arrives as an S wave um, better, right? And that has to do with how these waves vibrate, right? That the P wave, right, comes in and vibrates in this direction, right? So it's better recorded the vertical, whereas the S wave, that vibrates side to side, and so would be better recorded on the horizontal sort of component because the primary direction these arrivals come in, in is, is fairly vertical. All right, the next step that we do in a receiver function is we rotate the recordings, right? So we're going to rotate from the vertical and radial components to things that are direct, um, directly aligned with the P wave and S wave energy vibration directions. And so we can do that to... Um, clean up the recording of our P wave energy versus our S wave energy. This is particularly helpful because our next step is going to be a deconvolution, right? That we're going to use the P wave energy because it's a really nice approximation of the source time function, right? The, the energy released in the earthquake um, can be variable for many different earthquakes. And we want to actually combine information from many different earthquakes when doing a receiver function. Receiver functions are, are technically a stack of energy from many different so earthquake recordings that travel similar paths up to the, to the station, right? So we're focusing same station, many different recordings, right? But to do that, we have to normalize um, a, based on removing the source time function, right? That every earthquake can have a slightly different source time function. The P wave energy, when uh, focused on it here, can, can approximate that. So what we're going to do is we're going to deconvolve this energy from the S wave, right? That's what I'm showing on the next slide is we take this energy we deconvolve it from, from the S, and what we are returned is a spike uh, type function, right? That this sort of up, down, up is removed, and we're left with just a, a, an upward spike. Now, you'll see here this last phase has a downward spike, and that's because it travels two legs as an S wave, and so it has a, a polarity shift. Um, it, it changes its polarity. All right, but again, this shows us uh, a nice uh, timing of when those converted phases happen. Uh, and a nice clean spike that we can then use to, to, to image the, um, when where those recorded phases are happening. And, and really what we want to use is figure out what is the, the depth of the layer where that conversion is happening. And so that's our last step here, showing the, the application of this to crustal imaging. And so I want to show here some work from Vera Schulte Falcom uh, in the Himalaya, uh, and it's using receiver functions from a line of stations across the Himalaya that are then combined to produce, in essence, a cross-section of the crustal structure. So there's two parts I want to show here. The first part on the top here showing the elevation uh, across the, where the seismic stations are shown, right? So it goes from India uh, up into Tibet, right? And you can see the elevation here going through the Himalayas and into the plateau, right? And then this lower image is showing the receiver function imaging, right? So it's combined across this area, right? So the, the images here are showing receiver functions um, you think of that, the seismograms would sort of travel down like this, right? But we're combining all of them together along distance here, right? And so each receiver function is showing, you know, in essence, a, a peak at the, the structure below it, right? And so that's, we've converted the, the time from that last slide of the receiver function into depth here, where we've estimated the velocity and converted the time to depth. And so we're showing the conversion at the moho here very clearly in red, right? So the, the bright red color is showing how strong the conversion is 
for that for that moho. You'll see there are some other conversions here, particularly the the difference between the upper and the lower crust there, there is a discontinuity in velocity there that shows up as a conversion as well. But I wanna focus your attention on the moho here because that can moho conversion indicates the crustal thickness increases from about 45 kilometers under India to about 75 kilometers under Tibet. So a, a nice utilization of our receiver functions to show differences in crustal structure. So this can be used in other ways uh, to look at plates, uh, look at uh, lithospheric thickness, you can use it um, to show the, the downgoing subducted plate interface relative to the overriding plate. So, so other key velocity discontinuities can be imaged with receiver functions.